Hey, Janet. Hey, David. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Looks like oh. you have an audience of one today. So <laughs> I think it's a just star us of chickens. The show. <laughs> well. <laughs> Has this fulfilled your lifelong dream that you get to be the star of the show? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Actually, I tend to be more of a quartet kind of gal. Not okay. a not a diva, but I can get my diva on when I need to. Uh, we we I did a, we had a whole bunch of other people planning to come, but I sent them all away so you could have this moment just for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Are you in Portland? I am. Okay, so we're on the same gr coast, which here today is gray. <laughs> are, are you in Seattle or? Seattle area. Yeah. Newcastle. It's like a half an hour from everything I need to get to. I'm not, I've never even heard of what, what direction from Seattle is that? It's south and east. Okay. South of Bellevue, north of Renton, west of Issaquah. <laughs> I know where all those cities are, but I've never heard of Newcastle. <laughs> a little hidden gem. Okay. Except it's gotten really big since we moved here, so the yeah. the shine is off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think about all those uh, places we used to go when I was young that no one knew about, and they were so great because no one knew about them. And now every travel writer and their and their cousins, but he writes about it and exposes it, and then it gets overrun and ruined, and things that used to be dirt roads become highways. And yeah, yeah. You're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, how can I help you today? Like, what, what, what do you, how do we want to use your time to explore this program? Well, that's exactly it. I'm kind of like, is the ID way for me? I don't know. I am. Um, I do a lot of work with Julie Stringham, and she has spoke <laughs> so highly of the program. And I did your narrative coaching program when it was part of W Bex, uh -huh. and I appreciate you. <laughs> not being part of W back, <laughs> which might speak to my own personal, um, what resonates for me is when you speak of coach maturity, that mm -hmm. really resonates deeply. I am fatigued by being marketed to. Um, and I have really loved actually, well, this might be a connection that um, the things that you've done with Allison. Um, Partly because you just model hmm. that you sort of presence and coach maturity and non-anxious presence in such a way that it is both a model and a great reset for me. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if that's <laughs> so so there you go. that's what I came with. Okay. Thinking, what should I explore? <laughs> yeah. So um yeah, the, I mean the the my W Bex days are were extraordinary in some ways and obviously quite challenging in other ways. Um, but um, uh, came at a good time for me. And you know, I wish I knew now what I then what I know now about the work. And and but um, yeah, so the program, the narrative coach program, has evolved quite significantly since then. Now that I'm freer to make it what I wanted to make it, and yeah. kind of have a better understanding. Um, and um, the uh, the ID way sort of grew out of two things. It's evolved. We launched it in the pandemic, which we actually opened up for business the day the pandemic. We went into lockdown. That was quite exciting. Uh, wasn't a great karmic timing, but hey, there you go. But we had a really successful first cohort because everybody was freaking out. And um, but it it emerged. Um, years ago when I was doing um, a lot of large-scale change projects. And uh, most of my work around coaching, aside from teaching and writing, has been uh, incorporating coaching in large-scale change and leadership projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and motion, coaching more as a verb than a noun, so mm -hmm. just sort of part of skill sets, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, I was doing these two major projects for the state of Oregon and um, and, and got involved in a variety of other federal, federal things because of that. And um, just started to really kind of wonder, like what I was doing something very unique that nobody else I knew was doing. And I was winning work that uh, was unusual in a way for someone like me with a more of a OD and ch change background. Yeah. 
Uh, and then at one point I sort of, I, I had an opportunity to begin to uh, weave the coaching piece into more because that was 20 years ago when coaching was really quite new in many ways. Mm-hmm. And in all that, I started to kind of review these projects and wondered why some of them were so successful and what was I doing differently. And that primary variable for me was there were projects when I was trusted enough to just be David mm. and not be in any box. Because the reality is our client problems are not in boxes. <laughs> and then people try to like, <laughs> I know. It'd be much more convenient for us if they were, but they're Here's not. this box. <laughs> they're messy. They're they're confusing. They're um and so the uh and it was like I could be, you know, I could talk to the governor one minute and talk to the server builders the next minute, all yeah. in service of the same vision and kind of morphing language and role. And, um, you know, um, we had one of our key people have a significant death. So in order for her to be able to stay involved, I, I did some grief work with her. Mm-hmm. And so, and then I had an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to be invited to come do a large scale uh, training intervention around coaching for a, um, a, a small like 300 person organization that served disabled children mm. and um, it was a turning point for me because she said I'd like you to come teach coaching to us and I said I could but I'm not going to and she's like why I said because <laughs> it, because consultants never turned out like interesting work right right and said, because I know how hard it was for you to raise that grant and those funds for this and I don't think it's going to give you what you want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so was he said, and I liked, I liked her from the get go. I, I mean, I ended up working with her for two years really intensely, but um, mm-hmm. I said, because um, I don't know yet, but I'm, I'm building this piece around what I'm observing about my own practice. So I'll come back to you in the morning. So I went home that night and invented integrative development. Mm-hmm. Um, I had been doing all the pieces, but I started to put them together and then the big, mm. the big aha was that I couldn't propose a different strategy or approach using old school pedagogy. Mm-hmm. But training and education are all about mm-hmm. they're, yeah. they're you know they're two hundred years old at, at minimum. They're not yep. very effective, yep. and that's what we build everything off of. Mm. And um, so I I um, pulled together a whole bunch of things for my PhD that I had not done used in narrative coaching and started to think about a different way of understanding learning development that was much more in tune with nature our uh, mm-hmm. our history as a species where as cultural storytellers as um in sort of intrinsic learners mm-hmm. um progressive child psychologists and educators like maria montessori and led by godsky and um as well as just a pull of Freire, all these people kind of really championing a different way of understanding and observing how humans are learning, learn and develop. So to make a long story short, uh, it started in this sort of uh, flow of different professional uh, roles, but it began mm-hmm. to be this whole, like what if we like really inverted the paradigm of how we go about supporting learning and development? Um, and so I created ID as a way to give people a frame for how to do that, ah. and, then, and and how to and then we, um, we which we talked for a few years, but then we realized it really takes a pretty mature philosophy of life, a pretty s- a secure spiritual and psychological grounding, to be to stand there without a curriculum, or without a workbook or a plan. Mm. Um, and so that's where this other piece of work, which was a spiritual philosophy, came in. It's non, it's non-dogmatic. It it's not about, you know, it's about um, my way of seeing the world that helps support our capacity to trust the learning process. Mm. Uh, and so that's now woven in to give people more grounding and how do you actually work this way? Mm. As you if you like like all this yammering about presence doesn't really matter if you're grounded in an old epistemology or old cosmology that I'm being present because I'm noble and I'm grand and I'm, you know, I'm the center. So I better be grounded as the center. And. Oh yeah. It's nothing. It's actually not, it's not you in the center, right? It's just it's not correctly. right. It's no. no, um, little things have just kind of sparked. Oh, that's interesting. I, um, I know 
I, I know, I think I first saw you when you were talking about being a recovering academic at a SIAP conference on coaching back in really? Minneapolis. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. wow, that's a flashback. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, he's a real coach here. He's not yelling, lecturing about a bunch of other stuff. That was really cool. Yeah, um, it was an odd, odd experience, by the way. But anyways, um, yeah. <laughs> it's an odd time, right? Um, yeah. But uh, so, because I do have a master's in IO psychology, so there's all that sphere. And then I I laugh when you talk about L&D just because I was... <laughs> I was also the chairman of the local chapter or the board chair of that local chapter of um, ATD <laughs> briefly. I'm oh. still recovering. I loved the people. <laughs> and then it's I, like, I did that I for a year in Portland years ago as well. So I can appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, I can't. Um, but also the kind of coaching I've appreciated is often where people are in a broader learning context. So I've supported, I, I don't know if you know Bruce Avolio. Uh-huh. Yeah, so he has had some leadership academies, for example, with the firefighters, et cetera, I, um, which was just awesome to work with in so many ways. But I like that they've kind of owned curriculum and I get to be a, like a thought partner, sense maker, the so what person mm -hmm. of it all. And I am I think have been practicing more just showing up in that and have it be more mm -hmm. playful. And I, so I, I I might be still bridging older paradigms and current paradigms, but I, it's not. Uh, there are aspects of, I um yeah presence that I yeah I, that transcend anything ICF language wise. Yeah. That is sort of frustrating. So that is, a little bit where I am. I'm trying to um. I I'm like if you could describe the id way and seeing the world in in a particular way i guess what what <laughs> if the ida were narnia what is the thing i'm walking into <laughs> well, that's i think one of my favorite questions of all time if your work is like chronicles of narnia then <laughs> <laughs> wow great just flash back to another part of my life yeah there you um, go <laughs> So I I would say uh, if like an, an analogy would be in the terms of music, it's like jazz. Yeah. Yeah. It's improv theater. It's but it's deeply grounded in um, <clears throat> the um, honoring of the human, um, the focus on readiness above all else. Um, it is um, just fully trusting the emergent moment. Mm -hmm. And so we. Um, in, in its work when it's in its purest form, which isn't always the case because it's married to a variety of things in a project or whatever, and the realities of that and the politics of that, et cetera. But in its purest form, um, we we uh, it, it's a frame I think of as structured emergence. Uh, traditionally, we create structures and pray for emergence, but usually our structure sort of kills emergence. But, um, or, but it's, I don't think I put it in the slides I prepared for today. Oh, I did. Well, I'll show you this, because this is probably, um, let me just show these pictures, just so it'll be easier. We're going to have an illustrated version. If you're going to have Narnia, I might as well have pictures. There you go. Um, yeah, so, um, I'm going to start all the way up here. Um, can you see this? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So this is a uh, was the first piece of Aboriginal art I bought when I I spent a lot of time working in Australia and lived there for mm -hmm. a while, and um, and so you know oftentimes we get a partial view of a client like uh, there's something happening I think there's some birds involved but you know it's often quite muddy what's actually really happening for a client, mm -hmm. and we often try to like um, engineer something or build a huge plan out of this partial view and sometimes we're right and oftentimes we're not and so. We don't, but what if we were to say, well, I'm actually, this is a snapshot of a movie and there's actually something already in motion and it's not mine to try to um, discern exactly where everything is going. And so it's really more about just sort of noticing what's happening mm. and kind of, the whole, oh, that's what this is. Mm. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, we're entering into a space in which something's trying to happen or some awareness is emerging or and our job is um, just to discern 
what is the next step on this journey? That's all we need to like focus on. Yes, there can be a vector of where we're going and what we're trying to accomplish, but actually what that's needed next is, is hard to know. Mm. You can have 30 people in the same class for completely different reasons, completely mm. different levels of readiness and experience. And so we have these fantasies that when we end up spending endless uh, hours, thousands of hours of our life preparing curriculum as if we could somehow guess what people needed. And so I just said, well, what if we got that, those thousands of hours back? Mm. We actually did something useful, which was to actually walk with people while they're trying to um, emerge. Mm. And so, um, you know, I'll skip this. So, so structure's not enough. I mean, I, you know, you've, if you're, sometimes in the old days when you were in a, a new airport, you're trying to find water, right? And they're hidden every, you know, and so a fountain is great. If you're, if you're in a place and you're thirsty and there's a fountain nearby, they're great. But that assumes there's clean water. That assumes you know where it is. That assumes you there's no long line. And there's a lot of assumptions. So it's like our training programs. I built this amazing fountain. Why are you all complaining about being thirsty? Why are you dehydrated the next day? Which would be the equivalent of them forgetting pretty much everything you told them the, the day before. Mm. But then you don't want just emergence either. Otherwise, you're having a lovely conversation on the <laughs> bench and the tsunami comes. Which is, this is when people are too free form and well, anything goes and it's all, it's all just, we'll just, uh, we'll figure it out as we go. It, it doesn't often preserve enough safety for people. So I think of this yeah. um, more like an estuary uh, or I think the next picture is of a man in a flotation tank. But this, an estuary is actually next door to where I used to live in, in the Bay Area. And mm. um, uh, it was just like literally next door to where I lived. But um I loved it because the land didn't change a lot, but the estuary changed by virtue of the tides, uh, the wind, the rain, the migration patterns. And so there's about a two mile hike around this estuary here, which I did thousands of times and it was never the same hike. And so the land and the water were in this, and the vegetation and the, and the animal and bird life were in this dynamic balance of everything rose and fell to account for what was happening. Mm. so we we uh you know uh without getting too nerdy you know, we uh look at scaffolding as yeah, scaffolding has been in my head since you started this i'm yeah. like well the airport's kind of scaffolding if you've been in one airport it's kind of scary but if you've been in five you can probably find the water yes the, there's a pattern you start to discern yeah yeah and uh, so yeah so it's all about um Vygotsky's notion of scaffolding so we're trying to discern yeah, so we build things to create moments where people start to like, um, where they start to actually like in most traditional programs, you'd be teach, 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 practice. Well, we we would just introduce and then practice and then learn. Mm -hmm. So we put the action first because you're going to discover what you actually need when you're in motion, mm -hmm. not when you're sitting there um, mm -hmm. talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're finding ways to like, oh, so now we've kind of distilled what really, what's the mental block? What's the anxiety? What's the whatever that stops you from taking that next step? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that one simple way to think about this is if you, um, you know, if you think about uh, toddlers who are learning how to walk, a vital instrument in that process is your leg. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> I have a great nephew. I get yeah, it. <laughs> so, because that's in this, if, if if they can't go from crawling to walking, there's a whole balancing system that only evolves when they attempt to stand up. Mm. But they're not very high, so they fall down, they have lots of padding, so they go, like, oh well. But the leg provides this thing where I can hold on to it. I don't have to worry about balancing. I can just worry about standing. Mm -hmm. And so because I can't, I'm not developed enough as a, as a being to do both. Mm-hmm. So we're we're looking at, you know, when somebody's trying to learn a skill, whether it's a leader or, or whomever, mm -hmm. they have things that they already can do, but there's things that they can't quite do. So we kind of scaffold that mm -hmm. so they can stabilize what they're learning and who they are until they can do this more for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be different for every single person in the room. Mm -hmm. And then if they do bump into people that are on the same leg of the journey, then you can put them together so they can help each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, I'll take this down now. But um, so we we basically teach people how to work with people in whatever context you're in to discern openings 
uh, for the potential for learning, mm -hmm. finding ways to scaffold that, bring it to action, get reflection on action, and progress towards what they're needing to learn about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we and then we find that all kinds of uh, amazing things um, start happening because you're now relating to your environment very differently. Um, the biggest reason, so I don't, I haven't done a traditional training for probably eight or nine years, and I will never do them again because I don't find them very effective. Mm -hmm. um, and in using this work, we often um, discover that um, the reality that um, was not, it was, wasn't my idea, it was the guy that started all the big uh, famous leadership programs at GE, and he had this big awakening to, in, after they piloted their first round of mm -hmm. uh, we need to stop sending changed people back into unchanged environments uh. because the environment will always win. And, um, uh. and, and so, yep. so we, in full blown ID projects, we get people to change their environment as they're going. Yeah. Uh, they're learning as they're changing their environment and they're yeah. only getting training when they can't do it themselves, which isn't very often. Um, and so then we, it's really the quest for, what yeah. would need to be different here for you to be at your best more often? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's odd. I mean, you had me at jazz, but only because yeah. I, I tried to go play jazz. I, I was learning jazz piano. I don't think I found the right person for me because it's a different, because uh, we were, anyway, long story short, it's very difficult to keep the number of things going in your head that you have to. I don't think I got the right scaffolding. Okay. Because I'm classically trained. <laughs> And, ah. like, and it's kind of funny, but you know, if I, if I couldn't quite keep up with my hands, I'd sing it because I can hear it in my head, which is the most frustrating thing in the world. So I'll put that aside. I still have work to do in the jazz. But the other thing that it made me think of is, so I got a COVID puppy. Okay. And here's the thing with working with puppies and learning. They're always learning. So you're always it's not like you're teaching them a class that would be old school. Yeah. You're like teaching them to learn mm -hmm. and catching them in the act of doing good things, which is a really different thing mm -hmm. than sit, right? It's, um, Hey, so it, and then it's like, you take it on the road because they don't contextualize well. So you have to practice and do all the, and it, practice has to be fun. Otherwise, nobody's having a good time in different environments for that to happen. And the relevance for me, I was just working with, I've got a couple leaders I'm working with where um, they are completely self-possessed in certain environments, but something, someone, or something or someone, certain environments absolutely trigger them and they no longer have access mm -hmm. to themselves at their best so thank you for wandering with me for a moment because i realized that that it's like well that is i've learned a ton and i'm still learning with zuni just to help her function in this world as a good citizen because she'll have much more fun and I will too. Hmm. And then I think, well, that actually applies to leaders. Can they be themselves? Can they, can they bring more of themselves, their cognitive skills, their heart, their whole selves mm -hmm. to an environment and where, whether it's a mental block, like, you know, we often identify like, well, if I am this role, then I should behave in such a way. Mm -hmm. And that alone could be, debilitating but then how do you step out of that mm. does that relate at all to what you're doing <laughs> no but it's a fascinating sense? story no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> well, <he's really laughs> no no so your puppy story is very much i mean again mm. when you we fantasize that we put people through a training and then they'll be able to contextualize that learning when they go back to their office or go home completely different space and you know and there's all the social pressures of history of patterns of other people of baggage of all kinds of things systems that are dysfunctional that and you know uh, 
yeah, it, the transfer of learning is, unless it's at a very rudimentary level, like for example, traditional training and things can actually be very effective for beginners mm -hmm. who are trying to learn the basics of something. But when Still you're in a more there. nuanced thing like leadership or management of a team or you know, leading a project, it's very, you know, it's a very more advanced set of skills. And yeah. I find that the, the you, it's just the, the gap between those two contexts, the training room and the reality of their world, let alone the reality of what's happening around their world mm -hmm. is just so wide that, um, and so we don't need, we, we bring, we don't, we get rid of that over here, the training piece and bring the training into context mm -hmm. in real life, or we simulate real life, or we, um, and, and then we match that with what parts of yourself are not available to you. It's like to go back to your leader. What parts of yourself are not available to you in these contexts where you under function or over function, yeah. or whatever it is you do? Yeah. And how can we help you gain access to those parts of self? Is it because you've never tried them out enough? I mean, one of the things we teach is that, you know, adults don't have any place to practice. Right, 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 right. Like, right. like where do you practice being a parent or where do you practice being a leader? Right. Uh, and where do you practice new things? Like maybe you have an amazing coaches, coaching session with Janet and you've accessed this new part of yourself. But where do you go from there? Yeah, You can't do it at work because there's too many risks. Right. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and so the volunteer. Always, <laughs> yeah. And so we create safe places for yeah. our adults to practice. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, yeah. practice is half of the whole ID process from the very beginning. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of practice. <laughs> um, and I have a lot of practice to do where jazz is concerned and other things too. So that's great. Well, I, I remember years ago, there was a, I can't remember his name, but there was a really famous, I think he was a pianist. It might've been a saxophonist, but I think he was a black piano player. And they asked him about his training as a jazz piano player. He said, well, I, I studied music up, up until the point it got in the way of yeah. my playing. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was fabulous. Yeah, yeah. That sounds, I wonder, Oscar Peterson is amazing to watch and listen to. Yeah. Like I've, I've been listening and like, I, there's just a a fluidity to that playing. Or Marion McPartland. Oh my goodness. So amazing. Yeah, it's, a di it's a completely different brain function, I think, you know, to be able, <laughs> because we like, we study something, oh, I've got this and we practice it. It's very like, we're reproducing what's in our mind and what we've been taught. And these yeah. people sort of access like everything all at once. And they're like making up every note as it ha as it's happening almost. And there is structure and there is, you know, huge um, gift behind it, but it just, it's a different way of or or orienting yourself to the world. I, I, sure. It's like, you know, like gold is fleeing out, coming out of their fingers, uh, you know, yeah. or something, yeah. Yeah, I guess the other thing I might equate it to, because I, I did not study languages until college, and then I had to whip through it in a, like, I have to get my requirement done. So I, um, and then I got a master's in French, which makes me laugh. But it was at the time, um, I, Rossius, John Rossius out of Dartmouth was teaching, and he shifted the whole language. It wasn't about read and learn. It was, you start speaking from day one. Mm -hmm. You practice from day one. And um, he actually even, I, I talked to people who did his upper level classes. He came dressed as historical characters that his students got to interview. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So he also did improvisation. He had a background yeah. in theater and this, so you can you know, totally hear that. So, so there we are. And, you know, uh, the way our teacher had us go out, she's like, go out and have a conversation with somebody and you're looking for old people and children. <laughs> People with limited vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and patience or like yeah. children. Yay. And like somebody's finally going to listen to me. So uh, it, that you kind of had to learn and then just get over being embarrassed because mm -hmm. or not having a sense of humor for an entire year because it's hard to make jokes in, <laughs> in a fully different paradigm. <laughs> that is true. Boah. So, yeah. So... <laughs> So I hear what you're teaching and like philosophically, it sounds totally aligned. Do I just get to chat with you every week? What does this really look like in practical terms? <laughs> That's the advanced class. The oh. out with David class. All right. <laughs> no. Um, is, do, you, do you want me to tell you? I can show you some slides or I can just tell you. What would you prefer? You could just tell me. Okay. So the class is nine months. Yeah. Uh, there's nine modules. Um, 
Each module has the same shape. Uh, there's an initiation uh, session, which is live with me. It's all the basics of that module. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, in true ID fashion, uh, the second week, sort of like your French teacher, uh, you, we give you two assignments to go do things. Oh. One, one is on your own. It's a, we call it a stretch assignment. It's a more reflection or somatic in nature, mm -hmm. but it kind of gets you into the mindset of that module. Yep. And the second one is a field assignment, which would be akin to talking French to a four-year-old. Um, okay. So you practicing something that people think, why am I doing this? But then they realize in the end, oh, that's why we're doing this. So they're just smaller ways without any pressure um, to... Uh, experience yourself being a different way mm -hmm. um, the third week we'll come back um, and um, <clears throat> have a, another live session uh, called implementation and it's really um, kind of what are you discovering and what did you discover in your practices um, what is how does the material now seem to you now two weeks later um, and, and um, it's a way and we'll do some skill practicing mm -hmm. um, and then but so it's like really rounding out your grasp of the basics of that module. And then the fourth week, you have a th your third assignment, which is we will break you up into uh, pods by regions of the world. Mm. And we'll give you another assignment, which you can do, adapt, or ignore. Um, and people do all, all of them. Uh, but it's really an opportunity for you to um, understand from an ID perspective, what about all of this chat of this module would be most important for me to practice? Mm. And it might, and you know, I, I like the assignments I give people, but you might find there's another one that suits you better. So I'm not, again, in ID fashion, I'm not going to say, Janet, you need to learn this because it may have, been, you might think, hey, I've already mastered that or, or I don't care, or this is way more important because I've got a client for whom I need to get my head around this piece of what I'm doing. I'm doing. Yeah. And, and then we have an online forum, which is usually quite active. We have all the resources are in one place. Um, and um, let's see what else. And then there's no certification in this um, frame. So we have a portfolio that we ask people to complete at the end, mm -hmm. uh, which is usually like a three or four page reflection on your journey. It's for you, it's not for me. I mean, and you need to you know, show some basic comprehension of what we're doing, but it's not a test. Mm -hmm. um, it's really just a reflection. And people find that really important to not, um, you know, um, when we feel graded or judged, we tend to either have too much anxiety or we try to end up kissing up or we do all kinds of things which don't really reflect what we've learned. Mm -hmm. And um, we, in, our, in one of our, our narrative coaching program this year, we had th three people who were dealing with deaths of children and other things. And it was just pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, um, and so the group, the community just really gathers around people in these spaces and it made the learning so powerful for everybody they didn't talk a lot about this a very private thing but they you know, got a lot of support from their pod and um <clears throat> it made it all very real mm. um, um yeah and so my, i'm working on a book on id at the moment and um we'll have that out next year and kind of um, begin to uh, raise my prophetic voice even louder about why <laughs> why I think that this is a uh, part of the clue of what we could be doing around learning and development. Mm. Yeah. Sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it starts December. Yeah. January 17th. I think it starts January 17th. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm thoughtful <laughs> in this moment. Um, I, I would. <laughs> I'm good. Okay, I'm good too. Hmm. I'm good too. Yeah, I would love to think about it. I am. Um, um, I I appreciate where you're going. I I think it's. Um, wow. If everybody could be um, embracing their own learning in that way, um, what a what a powerful, powerful thing that could be. Um, so I'm gonna think about it. Um, mm -hmm. I am, I I am 
just balancing. I have, I'm fairly, I'm as busy as I want to be probably through March. And then I'm thinking about what that, so I would look at my January and February and think, okay, how would this make me, would, how might this help me as I navigate towards March? <laughs> yeah. Well, it might, might be, give you some good ideas about what you might be doing and we find people spend about an average of about 10 hours a month on this. So about okay. one, full day, one full day a month. So, um, and again, we, th this, this is for you. So um, yeah. my encouragement for people is pace yourself, move in and out as you, it works for you. Um, yeah. There's some times when we get busy, sometimes when our needs are higher. Mm -hmm. um, and what you'll find is um, just having the experience to the best of our ability to free you to learn what you need to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of, and so it takes a while for, in the beginning of ID, uh, all, uh, both of my programs, people get very frustrated and confused sometimes in the beginning because like, where's the stuff? Where's the stuff? And it, meanwhile, I'm saying there is no stuff. There's no stuff. And then about <laughs> third way through the program, they, uh, about a third of the way through the program, well, the light bulb goes on. Oh, I think he's been saying that the whole time. And, and then once people relax and yeah. stop trying to grab onto this and let it yeah. just be with them, and then yeah. everything changes and they have an extraordinary time. But there's, we're all so addicted to uh, almost like Pavlov's dogs to how we think we're supposed to learn because we've been trained at this for decades in school um, and at other parts of our life. Um, and so um the freedom that comes when you think this way and work this way mm -hmm. um is extraordinary mm -hmm. yeah um and i feel like we're in a time with you know just lots of tension and lots of misinformation and a lot of angry people a lot of just uh noise and fear and suppression and and so i feel like this work is so vital for us to be able to liberate people and help them trust themselves and be more discerning and be more kind and um and that's really the secret mission of all of this it's disguised as a learning development theory but in reality it's about kindness mm. yeah. yeah which is essentially as close as to what you can influence mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> as all of this mm. all right you mentioned this and your other program. Which other one were you referring to? Oh, I still teach the narrative coaching program. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. And that's evolved. Yeah. Well, this has been so fun. Yes. You have an audience of one. <laughs> to be an audience of one. There you go. <laughs> yeah, your, your bejeweled crown will be arriving in mail after we're done. I, I'm so ready. <laughs> It just a tiara is okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again. Thanks, Janet. Yeah. And um, I hope we'll see you in January. And otherwise, we'll go from there. Yeah. If not, you know, our paths may cross. They may. <laughs> they just may. But they I think you would, I would think you would enjoy the program. So I hope you'll decide to come join us. But, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think All right. I too. All right. Thanks, David. Take care. You Bye. Should. Bye.